It's a staple of reality TV and Internet fascination. Unsolved murder cases. Now amateur detectives can pore over public records, shared clues, and long-forgotten minutia searching for the tidbit that could solve the long-standing mystery. Writer Michelle McNamara has devoted herself to the work of citizen investigators with her website, truecrimediary.com. The latest case to enthrall her is that of a man she's dubbed the Golden State Killer. His spree included 10 murders and 50 rapes up and down California from 1976 to 1986. He's never been identified or caught. The story is told in the new issue of Los Angeles Magazine. Michelle McNamara, thank you for joining us. Thank you. I mean, this has been uh, such a growing field with people really able to um, share their interest in cases, share clues, work in their spare time, in some cases totally obsess over the cases. You know, share with us just as a cultural phenomenon what's at work here. Yeah, you know, I think it's interesting because I think also people think of this as kind of this true crime thing as a relatively new thing. But when you look back in history, I mean, the Bible is full of true crime stories, right? And, you know, in, even back in the 1870s, this boy Charlie Ross was kidnapped. That gripped the nation. It was a huge story. So there's always been um, this both fascination with true crime stories and I think a little bit of shame associated with that. People are a little queasy about it, which I – but I also think that's interesting because I think there's a lot of important questions that come out of our interest, you know, the criminal justice system, you know, who does it fail? Who do we prioritize as victims? Things like that. Those are important questions. Well, and even our sense of justice, because I think, you know, for, for some people, I, you know, I'm, I'm not involved with this myself, but I can only guess for some, it's really a sense justice hasn't been done. They want to be part of, of potentially bringing someone to justice. Certainly. And a lot of these cold cases, just the, the cold fact is that they don't get much love after a certain amount of time. So the fact, and that's, I'm primarily interested in just cold cases. I, I'm no, I, you know, I'm, you couldn't interest me for, you know, any amount of money in Casey Anthony or anything like that. It's more just the idea that there's this puzzle that could be solved with this data that is now available. And it really did change in the last, I would say, five, six years. Just more and more inf- information became available. And it really was this kind of you could use your creative process to look at maps, to look at public records, to try to figure out. And people are living more online now. So you could look at, you know, this this person went missing. Who are they mentioning in their blog? Things like that. Things that a lot of police will tell you they're just not doing yet. It, it's a generational thing, but they're just not doing it. They're not online. You know, for some reason, uh, the, the the man you've dubbed the Golden State Killer was not on my radar at all. Mm-hmm. And give us the thumbnail, if you will, of this case, because his spree of killing a, and rape is is horrifying. It's horrifying. And it's ast- it was astonishing to me when I read about it because I couldn't believe how under the radar it was. And it was there was a couple different reasons for that. He did, you know, he hid in all these different jurisdictions. They didn't really communicate about it. It wasn't until DNA connected it all. That So when you talk to police officers, they're often just kind of gripped by him and very interested in, in solving it. But the public is not as aware of him. So, yeah, he started up in Northern California. He moved to Southern California. He kind of mysteriously stopped in 1986. But one of his things that he did is he called his victims and really taunted them. And there was calls up until um, – police believe, you know, 2001. So it's, it's, you know, it's, there's a good likelihood that he is still alive and he's out there. Um, And they really do feel that this getting this information out there is what's going to lead to an arrest. Well, let's hear a recording from one of those calls. This is from a police phone tap. We have slowed it down a bit to make it easier to follow. Is Ray there? Mm -hmm. So that is purportedly the voice of the Golden State Right. One of the things he would do is he would, a lot of the victims would report wrong number calls. That was a ruse that he used to try to find out if they were home, things like that. So you have all these victims reporting that they got an unusual number of wrong number calls, which is unusual in general. You don't usually get a lot of those calls. So this was on a a tap. It, It came a couple calls previous to what we know was his call because he said something to the victim that he had said at the scene. So they're pretty sure that that, um, that that call was him. So this really piqued their interest because it was that wrong number call. 
um, and they're just hoping someone might recognize the voice. We're talking about the man that our guest, Michelle McNamara, has dubbed the Golden State Killer. If you have questions or comments, the story is in the brand new edition of Los Angeles Magazine. We're at 866-893-KPCC or the Air Talk page, kpcc.org. And we also have a link on our website to uh, a website that Michelle has set up that is totally devoted to this and share a little bit about how you're you're enlisting readers and listeners in this. Yeah, I mean, we're really trying to harness with LA Magazine, we're trying to harness the power of social media on this. And I think the editor in chief, Mary Melton, make a re- made a really good point today in her letter to readers, which is this is kind of 3D storytelling. It's something you can't get from the print version. You're going to be able to listen to his voice. You're going to be able to open a map that they believe he drew with his hand and look at the map. Um, so what's exciting to me is it's this kind of 21st century investigation um, and really getting the word out through social media and hitting as many people as possible t- with the hopes that, again, he, he gets ca- captured. The man known as the Golden State Killer struck in such communities as Dana Point, Irvine, in Ventura, Goleta in uh, Santa Barbara County, up in East Sacramento. In fact, East Side Killer, wasn't that the first um, name that they gave name him? was East Area Rapist. Or East Area mm-hmm. Rapist, okay, because mm-hmm. it was east of Sacramento where he made the attack. Correct, yes. Mm-hmm. And then what was the second name that he went by? Well, so in Southern California, um, almost without a lot of thought, they were sitting around a table and some police officers d- described him as the original Night Stalker because what they meant is they had sort of just figured out that it was all one guy and that he had the same O as the Night Stalker Richard Ramirez, but he had been active um, earlier than him. So that name just kind of stuck much to their chagrin. They didn't like it. It's kind of a confusing name, but it kind of stuck. So then you get the awkwardness of East Area Rapist, Original Night Stalker. It's like a who's on first yeah. routine. People kind of go, well, what East where, original what? You know. So it, that's kind of why we renamed him the Golden State Killer. We'll continue our conversation with Michelle McNamara. She's the founder of TrueCrimeDiary.com and author of the Los Angeles Magazine featured this month on the cold case of the Golden State Killer, believed responsible for 10 murders and 50 rapes up and down the state of California. It's Air Talk on KPCC. Hetty Lynn Hurdies has the news. It's Air Talk. I'm Larry Mantle. Good to have you with us. We're talking with writer Michelle McNamara, founder of TrueCrimeDiary.com. She's written the Los Angeles magazine story about the mass murderer that she's dubbed the Golden State Killer, who was active from 1976 to 1986. Ten murders, 50 rapes are attributed to him, and there are a number of uh, signature elements of the crimes. Michelle, let's let's talk about those. What are the hallmarks of of what he did. Um, he was a prowler. He was, um, you know, there was often reported a large, uh, many people reported a lot of prowling activity in the neighborhood prior to, to an attack. He did a, a high level of surveillance. So he would go into someone ha- someone's house and he would, I mean, everything from, it's so terrifying, but he would hide ligatures under cushions um, so that when he was attacking you, he would you suddenly would watch this man take a ligature under your cushion. You didn't even know he had been in your house. So he'd have a big advantage even in the dark. Absolutely. And he always wore a ski mask. Um, he was incredibly athletic. He outran some of the most athletic police officers. He could vault fences. He always got. He sometimes um, rode a bike away from the crime scene. So he was very athletic. Um, he, uh, you know, he did. He did some other very odd things at the crime scenes. He would eat in the people's kitchens. He would make his himself food, which is uh, even in the middle of the attacks, mm-hmm. right? And I've been told that's really, really unusual. He he claimed he was there for money. Um, that was probably just to to uh, soothe their fears, and uh, he he clearly wasn't that interested because he would leave money behind and then take things that really mattered to them, like you know monogrammed earrings or rings or things like that. So, um, and then he, the calling he would call victims. Um, uh, yeah, he's very unusual. So he would really devote significant time to stalking the person. 
and and undoubtedly laying this out in his mind before carrying out the crime. Definitely. I mean, one of the investigators I said to, I talked to said, this guy was about the game of it. He he was, it, it was so much, he did it over and over again. He had a script in his mind that he liked to adhere to. And what really agitated him is if it didn't go that way. But that it was definitely the game of it was what got, you know, was what propelled him to do. Um, and And it wasn't so much... You know why he why he went from a sexual predator to a murderer is unclear. You know people escalate. Um, you know I, we're not really sure. That's not always how it goes. But but he definitely and after 1979 there were no more victims that ever lived to to talk about their experience. So. Were the people that actually lived who you know saw him and were able to in some way describe him? Um, they were uh, young women. Um, Sometimes women who were – so he first began hitting young women and girls, attacking young women and girls in Sacramento in 76. At a certain point, the police, uh, ill-advisedly in my opinion, said something about, oh, you know, this guy is just a real weasel. He just goes after vulnerable women or something. And after that, he began attacking couples um, and only couples. So uh, he – he, I don't know if that was upping the challenge for him or what. But the – so primarily everyone in Northern California could talk about him. But he wore a ski mask. So unfortunately, no one really ever got a great look at his face. They can just – you know, they know he was a white guy. They know he was probably around 5'9". He was not a big guy. He was athletic but not built. Um, and he had light eyes, blue or blue or hazel eyes. Has the DNA that he left at the scene now been run through the state's database? Def- yes, and they have it. And um, it, that's really interesting to investigators as well because they would have thought this guy – I mean, you're talking about such a prolific offender. How could he not have a record? But, you know, because of this case, ironically, Proposition 69, which passed in 2004 – was passed inspired by this case. The brother of one of the victims pa- helped pass Proposition 69, and I ro- and all these cold cases have been solved. And ironically, and tragically, this case has the one that was the real precipitator has. Yeah. So, um, which is kind of this amazing backstory uh, um, about the case, but. So, yeah, they have his DNA. It hasn't hit uh, in nationally or California, and it hasn't there. They run it familial DNA, too. So he doesn't have a biological, you know, a son or a brother who's in the system for a felony either. Mm. And and do investigators believe that he's he's still alive or, you know, what are the odds that that he well, might have died? And that might be why the crime spree stopped. There's certainly the possibility that he's he's dead and you'll get different opinions from investigators about that. The mm-hmm. FBI ran an actuarial study and they they their conclusion was that there's an 85 percent chance that he's still alive. He would only be, you know, 58, 60, 62. Well, he that's would, for an average person, though. But this guy clearly was a risk taker, right? Right. He was a risk taker, but he was very athletic, and he didn't. No one ever smelled smoke on his breath. I mean, you take into consideration those kind of things. I mean, it's definitely possible, but I just look at it as sort of like, what is the percentage possibility? And I, I think there's a good likelihood because I think we now have enough examples of some of these serial offenders who actually did just kind of taper just off, mm-hmm. and they used to not believe that that happened, and now, mm-hmm. now they do. So. I think it's quite possible he's just out there. What is there a pretty strong sense of how old he was during the 10 years of the crime sprees? Yeah, I mean people, you know, it's funny when you read through the police files, a lot of the victims felt um they one of them it was like this was a kid. This was a, they felt he was like in 1976 they felt like he was anywhere from 18 to 25. Um you know, he could have been going back and forth, you know, either year, you know, could have been 18 to 30. But I'm I'm guessing probably the most likely number that came up was like 22 or 23. So I bet he was born in the early 50s. All right. Jennifer in South Pasadena, you're on Air Talk. Thank you. I'm so fascinated by what you do. And, and you're clearly your guest is so clearly in this cr- criminal mm. head. My question is the murder data versus the rapist victim data is so broad and my question to the guest is is did in all of your research were you ever able to put your finger on why the people that survived his rapes were survivors and why he made the decision to murder the ones that he murdered um that's a really good question and yes i i have i think some insight into that he um the last couple attacks that happened in 1979, one up in Northern California and one in Golita, they got away from him. They um, so it got out of his hands. And, um, 
he was caught by a sleeping husband and kind of had this confrontation. And then this couple down in Galicia escaped. My theory is that he just was this, you know, this was this egomaniac, violent, sadistic guy who was like, no one's ever going to get away from me again. And they didn't. You know, so that's to me, I think that's why he so turned he homicidal. learned he learned from his failure in that early case. Right. Right. All right. I appreciate your call, Jennifer. Thanks so much. B.C. writes on the page. Michelle, do you ever think about the Golden State Killer contacting you or bringing harm to you? Oh, never. No, I obviously I think about it uh, probably too much. Um, I do think about it, but, you know, I. I just don't think there's a lot of examples of someone reaching out to a journalist. I'm not too frightened, no. And I I think that there's people, you know, he he would have been after certain other people involved in this case long before me. So I'm not that concerned. When professional investigators look at this case, do they feel like it's really too thin in the amount of accumulated information to make it likely to solve? Or do they feel like, no, you know, just one good piece of evidence and we could crack it right there? Well, you know, it's funny because I was just talking to an investigator last night about this and he was saying, you know, especially because a lot of this happened in the 70s. And he said, up in, I grew up in the 70s in Sacramento. There was just crazy stuff going on everywhere. So when something, when you would try to get tips, there was just a flood of, I saw this weirdo here, I saw this weirdo here. Because there were a lot of weird things going on. Right. It was just, a, it was kind of a crazy time. So he said, we had these files and paperwork, just hundreds of pieces of paper with all these tips. And I believe somewhere in there is the tip that is the information, but it's sorting through it and figuring out what's important. There's almost, I think it's like um, someone from an Agatha Christie or Sherlock Holmes has this bit about, you know, there's too many clues to solve the case. And with this one, you almost feel like there's too much data. So what are you ideally hoping for with uh, the web presence that you've established for the Golden State Killer case? What what are the kinds of tips that would be most helpful? Um, I, I They're looking for, um, you know, people who have um, sus- maybe always suspected someone who, who someone who they know who fits the geographic profile. So someone who had a strong tie to Sacramento, who then moved prob- maybe to Contra Costa County, then had a tie to either uh, Santa Barbara definitely Irvine. Um, so, you know, that that trail, someone who might remember an uncle or a cousin who lived in those who, places. Who had a similar path. Right. So they're looking for that. They're looking for someone who maybe, hey, did you live in Sacramento in the 70s? And this person, whenever this case comes up, acts very strangely about it, doesn't want to talk about it or wants to talk about it too much. You know, those kind of things. They're looking for names and just hard facts about these people that they can look into. Um, they just want to know the backgrounds of, you know, some of these tips. So... And they're hopeful. Michelle McNamara with us, founder of TrueCrimeDiary.com and the author of a story in the brand new edition of Los Angeles Magazine detailing the spree of the Golden State Killer. That is the name that she has given to the man who is linked to crimes from 1976 to 1986, 10 murders, uh, at least 50 rapes that are associated with him. He went by a couple of other names depending on the geography of where he committed his crimes. So she's given him a uniform name to try and add some clarity to this case and hopeful that members of the public will contribute information that might help solve this long cold case. We're at 866-893-KPCC or the AirTalk page kpcc.org. K asks, is it possible the killer's DNA could be on the ligatures? Well, they have his DNA, so they don't need, um, you know, I mean, I, she's probably referencing like touch DNA. Yes, they, they even up until last year, they were still linking cases to him through DNA. They have they have it in the system, so they don't need any more of it. Um, and gosh knows he committed so many crimes. I don't think they need even to add on. But yeah, they ha- they have that. You mentioned about people saying how crazy it was in the 70s, and we did in the 70s and through Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker and of the 80s, these horrible, horrible crimes uh, with people inflicting you know, tremendous pain on, on not just the people that were directly victims, but but really on larger communities and the fear that was generated by them. Do you think that a lot of this was imitative behavior, that one of the reasons there was so much of it was just it, that, you know, one begat another begat another. Was something else going on? You know, I have thought about that. I actually uh, thought about writing a book even about the 1970s were just 
filled with so I, I mean there is I was looking into a, a freeway murderer in um in the Los Angeles County and someone this William and, Bonin case or another one well that's what's interesting so I was talking to this cop and he said we know there's three of those so which one are you talking about <laughs> wow. I thought you've got to be kidding me and so there's so many and I don't know if it was a post I mean I suppose you could look at it as like a post Vietnam hangover type situation the 70s were just they were definitely a dark decade for violence um and the, and I don't really know what was going on there um but it was it was definitely bad. Hmm. Uh, Tracy and Hesperia, you're on air talk. Yeah, I was wondering, you said that he doesn't have anything in the police database, but I'm sure he's gone to the doctor at some point. Do they tap into those databases for, to check for DNA that way? Oh, well, the, the doctors don't, they would, they wouldn't have his DNA, your DNA because the medical community can't legally do that. So they can't do it that way, unfortunately. But you could have a doctor who had someone come in with suspicious injuries oh, or something sure. like or a hospital that treated someone. Um, you know, how many investigators are are still sort of working this case in some way, shape, or form? A lot, actually. Um, it, the, all the jurisdictions have point people and they're meeting they've been meeting for the last year and a half in this sort of renewed task force so i would say actively there's probably five or six um and then there's two retired who have it all in their head as i like to say when i talk to them they just it's just so present for them um you know, I think the most exciting thing, just to go back quickly to the DNA thing, yeah. is this, you know, there's they're kind of on the breakthrough right now of doing this ancestral DNA. And it's really interesting to me because it hasn't all been sorted out. And I think it's probably a year from becoming something they can actually use. But they can now, I mean, they can look at your DNA and say what country of origin your your paternal line came from. They can, I was handed a list of you know, 10 possible last names, um, you know, and and again, like I wasn't able to use that in my story, but that's really fascinating to me that, that we're just on the brink of being able to use that. Wouldn't that be ironic if somehow it was DNA evidence far more um, precisely uh, rendering an identity than anything you'd get from any other clue, that mm-hmm. it would be down the road science would unlock that. Yeah, I do think that's really fascinating. Uh, let's see, James in Long Beach, has anyone looked at credit card spending patterns in the areas? I, I don't know even know how you'd get at that well, without huge warrant you know, database searches. Not so much credit card, but one thing that has been looked at is um, there were a lot of the places he attacked were um, like they were just building a subdivision right there. There was a lot of real estate stuff going on. So there's been a lot of um, interest in what was being built in that area. Was there a contractor maybe who moved from one town to the other? Because that was very common back then, these crews, you know. So they really looked into what was being, you know, why was he here just two times? Why was he in Golita just three or four times? Was something being built at that time? Um, you know, so that's that's a, a path for sure. Michelle, appreciate your being with us. We have links on the AirTalk page at kpcc.org to all the information about this case. Uh, Michelle, following up on the cold case of the Golden State Killer, uh, linked to 50 rapes, 10 murders from 1976 to 1986. The man's never been identified and, of course, never been found. She operates the truecrimediary.com website as well as writing this story for L.A. Magazine. And I guess the good thing is you're married to a, a well-known comedian, right? <laughs> so he can help provide a few laughs at least yes, as you deal it's with a this very dark odd, stuff. It's an odd household of comedy and crime. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank I appreciate you. it very Thank much. You. Michelle McNamara, <laughs> TrueCrimeDiary.com, joining us on Air Talk. Have a very good afternoon. Hey, don't lose any sleep over scary stories like this, um, because remember, crime is down overall. Have a good day. Stay tuned. BBC News Hour coming up next here on 89.3 KPCC.